When previously exiled Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte returned to France in 1815, he was fixated on returning to power. Napoleon was a top-notch military commander who brought somewhere in the neighborhood of 72,000 troops to the Battle of Waterloo. Despite this, the little dictator was soundly defeated by the smaller force led by the Duke of Wellington. Napoleon blamed his defeat on his generals in poor health, but historians aren't so sure. Today, we're going to take a look at why Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know what other historical battles you would like to hear about. Okay, shall we do Waterloo? Maintenant! Emerging from the French Revolution as a military hero, Napoleon Bonaparte was able to take control of France in the late 18th century. He embarked on military campaigns throughout Europe and arranged for himself to become Consul for Life in 1802. Finally, in 1804, he stopped being coy and went all the way, declaring himself emperor. By 1812, Napoleon had started wars with almost every country on the continent and was attempting to conquer lands all the way from Britain to Russia. A failed invasion of the latter eventually led to his defeat when a coalition of Prussian, Austrian, Swedish, and Russian troops took Paris in 1814. Forced to abdicate, Napoleon was exiled to the tiny Mediterranean island of Elba as a condition of the Treaty of Fontainebleau. According to the writer William Krakenthorpe, which is a pretty awesome name, who met with Napoleon during this first exile, most of the emperor's time on Elba was spent thinking about and planning his escape. France had become a constitutional monarchy and placed the weak and increasingly unpopular Louis XVIII on the throne. Napoleon, who still had his eye on seizing power, thought the time was coming to make his move. Napoleon kept in constant contact with his associates in France, which was a relatively short distance away. He was allowed many visitors, which helped him plot quite extensively, even while being monitored by the British. Finally, on February 26, 1815, after 10 months of exile, Napoleon left Elba with a handful of soldiers. They easily eluded the British Navy and quickly made it back to the mainland. Of his decision to return from exile, Napoleon said, After making a mistake or suffering a misfortune, the man of genius always gets back on his feet. Or to paraphrase Chumbawamba, he got knocked down, but he got up again. Once back in France, Napoleon gathered troops on his way to Paris. Six days after his arrival, he was confronted by an infantry unit that had been sent for the express purpose of stopping his advance. Napoleon faced the soldiers alone and offered the chance to kill him to anyone who would take it. The soldiers instead broke into a cheer of, Way, way, long live the Emperor, long live the Emperor. From that point on, the army was with him. Within two weeks, Napoleon arrived in the capital and the king fled. Realizing they had only one chance to nip this thing in the bud, Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, who were at each other's throats deciding how to rebuild post-war Europe, quickly reunited. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and vowed to stop him again. On June 16, 1815, Napoleon's forces squared off with Prussian troops, led by Gebhard Liebrecht von Blücher at Ligny, Belgium. Napoleon won the battle. However, the Prussian troops made a fast tactical retreat and the French were unable to completely wipe them out. After the Battle of Ligny, 30,000 men, led by French General Marshal Emmanuel de Grouchy, went after the Prussians. Meanwhile, Napoleon marched his troops toward English forces gathering at a place called Waterloo. The soldiers that Grouchy had taken to chase down the Prussian army constituted roughly a full third of Napoleon's forces. After the significance of the battle became clear, Napoleon would send a dispatch to Grouchy ordering him to bring his troops to Waterloo. Grouchy received the dispatch, but he ignored it. Instead, Grouchy opted to follow the initial orders given to him by Napoleon. Napoleon would later blame Grouchy for the loss at Waterloo. He believed the marshal had intentionally withheld the troops, saying, I would have won that battle without the imbecility of Grouchy. In truth, Grouchy's decision didn't make much of a difference. Napoleon's dispatch didn't arrive until late afternoon, and there was no direct path to Waterloo from Grouchy's location near Wavre. In other words, there was no way he could have made it in time to change the outcome. In all fairness to Napoleon, though, he did order Grouchy to pursue Blucher, who was at Waterloo. 
The following night, it poured rain. The coalition of British, Belgian, German, and Dutch troops that had come to fight the French slept beneath a heavy and incessant torrent of rain. It was still coming down on the morning of June 18th and the ground was muddy. There were brief lulls in the inclement weather and both sides used them to prep for battle. Neither side, though, made a move. Napoleon spent the morning assessing the terrain. He knew the wet conditions around Waterloo would make combat extra difficult, and while he wanted to start the battle as early as 9 a.m., he wound up having to wait until 11 to launch his first attack. It was a reasonable tactical call, but the delay would cost him dearly. Little did Napoleon know, but the Prussian troops, commanded by Guy Liberex von Blücher, were on their way to Waterloo. The 30,000-odd troops intended to join with the British forces of Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, and the battle's late start gave them plenty of time to get there. During the battle, Napoleon kept his Imperial Guard in reserve. They were finally deployed sometime after 7 p.m. in a desperate bid to salvage the fight. Napoleon was reportedly somber and very pale when he made the decision. Sending his own guards into combat was a desperate move that put his very life at risk. Nonetheless, he sent them in. It is generally agreed that they were dispatched to the center of the British lines in two columns, although there are those who have suggested the guard moved in square formations. Napoleon ordered his men to advance in a column toward a strategically important farmhouse compound called La Haie Sainte. His battalions lined up one after another, leaving little space between them. The columns were meant to be wider than they were long, but it didn't go down like that. The columns, in the words of one contemporary commentator, became too extended to conduct any meaningful maneuver, and impossible to deploy without much trial and error into a good formation against cavalry. In the early afternoon, Napoleon dispatched infantry to the core of the British forces at La Haie Sainte. Led by General de Division, Comte Jean-Baptiste Drouet d'Erlon, the attack had the support of roughly 80 cannons. At first, the strike was quite successful, but they were soon confronted by British infantry troops led by Thomas Picton. Picton's men completely stopped the advance of Derlon's troops, and Wellington's cavalry was able to swoop in and drive them back. An entire brigade of the second French division was almost completely annihilated in the exchange. According to the recollections of British cavalryman John Dickinson, Wellington's forces sabered many of the enemy gunners. Dickinson recalled hearing the Frenchmen yet crying, Diable, when I struck at them and the long-drawn hiss through their teeth as my sword went home. British Commander Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, lined up the bulk of his forces along a plateau at Mont-Saint-Jean. Additional troops were placed nearby at Papelot, La Essante, and Hougoumont Farms. Napoleon knew the high ground was a formidable advantage. Intent on drawing Wellington's men away from their position, he sent a group to attack Hougoumont Farms. This diversionary attack was led by Napoleon's own brother, Jerome, along with General Honor Riel. Unfortunately for them, the British forces at Hougoumont were able to withstand the French incursion. After the French broke the gate to get in, the British even closed it behind them, trapping the Frenchmen inside. The British then proceeded to slaughter the French troops. According to eyewitness Matthew Clay, the gates were clogged with the bodies of French soldiers who were scarcely distinguishable because they had been very much trodden upon and covered in mud. Despite the failure, Napoleon kept trying to take Hougoumont throughout the day. Ultimately, he sent somewhere between 13 and 15,000 French troops to try and take the farm. Marshal Michel Ney, Duke of Elchingen, Prince of Moscova, was nicknamed Red Lion on account of his red hair. He was also one of Napoleon's most formidable generals with a long history of success in the field. Commissioned as an officer in 1792, Ney went on to become Marshal of the Empire in 1804 and served with valor in the failed 1812 attack on Moscow. However, by 1815, Ney was fatigued and by many accounts had lost much of his military acumen. At Waterloo, Ney was placed in charge of the left wing of Napoleon's army, and things didn't go so well. Late in the battle, he ordered several cavalry strikes against the British, but without infantry support, they were pointless. In the face of defeat, Ney is reported to have hoped for his own death. He even told his men to come and see how a Marshal de France can die, which was probably not the most reassuring thing they could hear at that point. 
The task of retaking the village of plant saint from the French fell on Prussian reinforcements, led by General Friedrich Wilhelm Freiherr von Bülow. Once his 32,000 troops arrived at Waterloo, they attacked and retook plant saint in the early evening. According to one historian, this left Napoleon outflanked and threatened his line of retreat. Napoleon was left with little choice but to send in a division of reinforcements and try to take the village back. He was successful, but the victory was only temporary. Control over plants and Noir shifted back and forth throughout the fight, and in the end, Prussia won. Ultimately, Napoleon would be defeated at Waterloo and exiled to a remote island in the South Atlantic. He was stripped of his imperial title, and he lost all ties to his formerly regal life. Napoleon died in exile on St. Helena on May 5, 1821. The official cause of death was stomach cancer. So what do you think? What military leader made the biggest strategic blunder? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.